Author, activist, and political consultant Glenn Smith returns to the Plutopia podcast this time. He is not a fan of the conservative fanboys pushing the so-called Great Replacement Theory. Glenn also finds little to admire when they worship strongman dictators. How did so many European white men get so insecure? I mean, honestly, you know, I mean, uh, it, all of this comes from some deep insecurity that they're, that, that somebody's gonna take something they have away from them, or they can't compete with people in certain ways. I don't, I really don't know what it is. It's, but it drives this need to dominate so they don't have to fret about losing to somebody else every day of their lives, you know? It's a sad thing to see. Uh, they, they pretend that they do this out of strength, but really, it's 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 out of a, a very unflattering weakness, I think, in the men who really really begin to believe and to act in those ways. People seem to think that if they get a dictator, it's only going to be a dictator over those people they don't like. They're going to stay free, of course, but this dictator is only going to mess with people they already don't like, and it never in history has worked out that way, ever. The people who think they're getting the kind of dictator leader they want always wind up being just as victimized as anyone else under such leadership. And you'd think people could like you know, learn it in high school, learn it in junior high or middle school, and not fall for it over and over, but they sure do. Hey everybody, welcome to yet another Plutopia podcast. Uh, I'm John Lubkowski, and uh, my co-host and partner in crime is Scoop Sweeney, and we welcome you back. We publish this podcast every week um, via all of the various places you can find podcasts, but also via YouTube, so look for our Plutopia News Network YouTube channel. Today's guest, today, it's the season to be politically anxious right now. And it's a perfect time for our guest today, Glenn Smith, who's an author, activist, and political consultant. And I so is that what you're doing mostly now, Glenn? Political consulting, or what's going on in your world right now? Yeah, I mean that's it. I'm uh, focusing on a couple of a couple of big national nonprofits rather than candidates, and a lot of a lot of it has to do with defending democracy and opposing things like Project 2025 nationally, that sort of thing. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, as far as defending democracy is concerned, is the the evident uh, moves in various states by the MAGA people to uh, take control of the management of elections. Uh, what's happening with that? Is there any? Is there a building opposition to that? That's a great question. The answer, thankfully, is yes. Uh, there's this, in fact, I have never quite seen the sort of even state by state and national organizing going on to oppose those efforts everywhere. I mean, almost every election cycle, um, Democrats and progressive people have opposed efforts at voter suppression one way or the other. Uh, there usually is a pretty good network of lawyers that are standing by during election time to, to take reports of. Um, suppression efforts. It could, be, it could be different kinds, intimidation outside of polls, uh, phone calls, giving wrong locations for polls or wrong dates or like all those sorts of things. But this time it's different in, it's, in terms of number and probably quality of the opposition that's building. It's, but it's by necessity. We have never quite seen such an effort really to, uh, to subvert voting part of democracy at its very core of democracy completely. I mean, its effort has got several different element, uh, elements to it. Uh, but you see most of them, a lot of them get reported, uh, you know, putting MAGA people in charge of elections locally, intimidating old election workers that have been there forever and trying to get them out of the way. Um, it's it's going to be a significant battle. But I'm happy to say that the, the, the forces of truth and justice are are massing and they're they're going to be out there too. I know there's a bunch of uh, attorneys that are pulling themselves together, and uh, I saw I was at the Texas Tribune Festival uh, a week or two ago, and uh, 
saw Michael Ludig there, who was advocating very strongly for democracy and expressing great concern about the movements that we're seeing. I, is it correct? I think I've heard that uh, that there are actually a bunch of attorneys sort of joining forces to be ready to mount challenges in situations where, I don't know, where partisans are screwing with the vote counts and that sort of thing? Yes, in large numbers. Part of one of those is I, I work with called Democracy Forward, and their their group of attorneys. And what they what they have been doing for the last few years is assisting, <clears throat> bringing resources. They raise their own money, so they bring legal resources to help um, litigate sort of uh, right wing policy here. They're here in Texas, for instance. They helped file a suit when Governor Abbott vetoed the entire legislative budget. Uh, those sorts of things. They've been heavily involved in in the abortion issue, state by state, nationally, and book burning. But, but now they're helping with a big at the groups. Lord, I can't even name them all. Um, lawyers and and also activists, meaning people that are out in the communities working with individuals and groups and communities to oppose it. It's it's significant effort, kind of happening at all levels. From what'll happen inside courtrooms, what'll happen at election polling places, what'll happen at vote counting places. Uh, what will happen in the comms world where we let the press know what's going on. I mean, it's it's a pretty vast network of things being put together. The uh, Trump has uh, raged on about uh, uh, objecting to things like early voting and mail-in voting. But today he posted, early voting in Pennsylvania, go vote, make America great again. And uh, <laughs> he seems to be the master of speaking out of both sides or many sides of his mouth at the same time. He... Uh, uh, he'll do that, whatever he seems to, uh, uh, whatever seems to serve him in the moment, or whatever he thinks serves him in the moment. I do think there's an element of this that should get more attention than it's getting. However, and and, and so for years, um, I think a whole lot of say conservative voters were convinced, or really convinced, that uh, elections were being stolen from them. That the other side, we were doing things that they thought shouldn't be done. And I, I won't give them complete credit for good faith, uh, but for the most part, that's where they were. That's changed significantly over the last quarter century, and it's changed to a place that's going to be dangerous moving forward. I think a lot of hardcore conservatives have reached the point that they have that democracy has failed them. That subverting it itself, no matter what's going on for the other side, is a positive. If they want to get what they want, they're going to have to at least diminish the power of popular democracy. And you see that effort underway in Trump's first term. You see it underway in preparations for elections since Trump left office, and you especially see it this year. What concerns me is beyond the practices is that belief among conservatives that in order to create a conservative or even authoritarian America, they're going to have to, they're going to have to uh, jettison democracy. And I think they may not poll saying that that's what they believe, but that is how they're acting. And that's a great concern to me because that's a well, I, change. Well, I was just going to say, I got, I, going back to Michael Ludig, one of the things he said is that those people are not conservatives. They're revolutionaries and the kind of revolution that they are, fomenting or that they're supporting is also called treason. I agree with and that. And he was, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, the point being that those, the people we're talk, who are calling themselves conservatives are not necessarily conservatives. And many of the people who are conservatives in the way that we used to think about conservatives are now saying that they'll co support Kamala Harris. I hope that's right. But let me be clear. I'm really kind of speaking about people that I knew a quarter century ago that were conservative in a sort of traditional conservative sense, right? I oppose them on almost all their policy ideas, but nonetheless, there they were. Now, a lot of those people have have changed into more anti-democracy -democ revolutionaries, as you say. You know, they are basically authoritarians of one sort or another um, and, and don't believe that the popular will... Uh, Will, will deliver what's best for them and theirs. Uh, and that's a change. That's a significant change because it wasn't always like that. It's bubbled up over time in America, of course, <laughs> right? Um, 
but now it's got a head of steam like I don't know that it's had in use in terms of its popularity with a certain certain kind of people. Yeah, I mean, I think on the Democrat side, uh, well, I was reading something this morning uh, that Lakoff sent out about enlightenment fallacy. And I think part of the problem that some of us have had is related to, you know, to the enlightenment fallacy, which is uh, the belief that ideas are so intrinsic, you know, that they're so obviously right that any rational person would accept them. And, uh, and that's really, as it says, a fallacy. And there are people who are rational people who oppose democracy and they oppose democracy because they don't believe that it works. Uh, they don't agree with Winston Churchill. He said, you know, uh, that all the other forms of government were worse than democracy. Um, and I think a part of the problem we have is that we haven't really, we haven't really mounted a, an effective argument in favor of democracy because we just assumed everybody should think that democracy is the right way to go. Lakoff had begun speaking about that in the early 90s, right? I mean, you, you probably recall that I actually worked with him for several years and commuted from Austin to Berkeley. Uh, I do remember. Three, three times a month. Uh, you know, so what you're what he's talking about there when it gets to the big picture that you're mentioning, but let's start with a little thing first is what used to be known as the rational actor theory, right? It's basically should have fallen out of favor about a minute after it was invented. But still, a lot of our pollsters uh, were were taught it in college and still sort of follow it. And it's just this, that if you if you give people the right reasons uh, for and understand what they want, and you give them reasons of the best way to get there, they will they will reason themselves to the right answer. So you see that symptom of that, and especially from Democrats over the years, is they just think their policy arguments will carry the day because they're giving these facts to the people, and with those facts, people will come to the right conclusions. Well, the pe people aren't like that. First, we're very emotional creatures. Uh, we don't sit around and reason steps one, two, three, four, five, and six towards anything that we want. And I think we can look at our own lives and see places where we fail to do that time and time again. And so it's failed us in the policy or political sphere. Still underway. One of the interesting things about when when George first started pitching this around the country, and, and I took him to, you know, I mean, we, we, we had lunch in the in the Senate dining room of the Democratic senators long ago, I mean, they, he was pitching these to the right people. You can't imagine it wasn't just rejected, it was met with anger in many cases, because it seems so out of left field to those who had lived with that belief for so long. You can see it stubbornly, it's still there. Now, because of that, you concluded by saying, we failed to give uh, in-depth, uh, fully fleshed out, reasons for why democracy is the best way to serve our interests, human interests, and even the planet's interests. And we've not, we just assume people will like democracy because it's called democracy, right? But we have to demonstrate it, not just talk about it. We can't just give the reason. We have to show the health of democracy and how we can produce. And we failed to do that in any robust, fleshed out, 360-degree way. And for that, we've got to plead guilty, I'm afraid. Yeah, there's also the argument that, uh, or the fact, I, I guess this is a fact that, um, I guess you would say that some of the, like, say the MAGA people, I mean, think of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is famously kind of a pathological liar. Uh, he opens his mouth and the truth rarely comes out. And um, um, on that side of the fence, the MAGA side, there has been no commitment to truth, really. I mean, they'll just kind of say whatever they th think will work, you know. But I think with Democrats, and I, 
I don't know, somebody may fault me with saying, oh, you're just being partisan. But I think Democrats are pretty committed to the truth and make truth, truthful statements. I mean, obviously, any politician will bend and twist a bit. But if you, you know, if you line up what Democrats are saying versus what the MAGA people are saying, I think it's pretty truthful. But just making a truthful argument sometimes doesn't have as much force as a, as a false argument that, that goes straight to the emotions, I guess. Right. And I wonder how we deal with that, you know? What's, what's the best way to address that? The stories, you know, and you're seeing some, we've seen good examples right now on the women's health care issues. As uh, we've had, I think, uh, ProPublica has a story, I think it was ProPublica, about a Georgia woman who died because of the lack of care, because of doctors' fear that they'd go to jail if they delivered the care to her that she needed. And but there's a lot of those stories now. Those stories are being told, and it, they're they're much more powerful than just a statement of facts uh, about what women's health requires in, in the policy area, right? Which is what we've kind of relied on in the past uh, to our detriment. Um, Part of that comes to where we're being forced into that sort of more narrative role, storytelling role, because a lot of our victories over the years were, were obtained in the courtroom where the audit, where the where the judges do reason to a conclusion, right? You see that difference? Like, so we honed our arguments in a setting which in which that sort of a line of reasoning toward the right conclusion worked because it was a courtroom in front of a federal judge in appeals courts. But that's not where the, so now we've lost the courts. So we're not, because we've lost the courts and the other side's wise to our ways, we've got to learn the more storytelling way of approaching uh, our audiences, right? We just have to engage them in an emotional level. And I don't mean fear mongering, I mean, engaging them in stories that get, capture their imaginations and lead first and foremost to a sort of understanding in their souls of what we're talking about before their brains have fully, you know, taken it apart and putting it back together. It's very, very important. You know, and you could see its success because we've really moved the numbers on women's health issues and, uh, you know, a day late and a dollar short because we've really done it after Roe fell. But we're doing it now, and you can see how effective it can be. I think it's hard to conceal the fact that in something like the Dobbs decision, you're actually taking somebody's rights away. You can conceal that from men, but you can't conceal that from women because it's their rights. You know, it's something it's it's something that's that happens with them that doesn't happen with men. Men don't have to worry about getting pregnant. They don't have to worry about carrying babies to term. Uh, they don't have to worry about um, uh, pregnancy-related health issues that might kill them. And that, it seems, I mean, it seems sort of strange to me, uh, and possibly we should make more of it, that men are making this, healthcare decisions for women, men who are not doctors, who are not physicians, who are just politicians, and they're making healthcare decisions for women. But I don't know how to get around it, especially since, as you say, we've lost the courts. We've certainly, the Supreme Court has gone off to a fairly strange place, it seems to me. Well, you're sure right about it. And one of, one of the women did understand, two things, two parts to this. Prior to the Dodge decision, prior to the end of Roe v. Wade, uh, we polled really well on that issue for decades, frankly. Every, you know, when, when under assault in the political arena, more people believed in abortion rights than wanted to take them away. Um, but they didn't believe they'd be taken away. So what showed up in a poll didn't necessarily produce results at polling places at election time. Yes, they believed in it, but they made their decisions on voting um, on other issues. But that, to that gender difference, one of the things women always understood, because it's their, their embodied life, is that 
this thing is not just about abortion. It's about a broad need in women's health care, generally speaking. And they knew that this option was going to taken off the table in, in serious medical situations that they were going to die, that they were going to get very seriously ill. It had a lot more to do uh, than just with access to abortion itself. It's like some kind of standalone isolated thing. Men didn't get that, just as you say. Generally speaking, I hate to generalize about it, but I, you could kind of see it in, in, in even Democratic candidates, male candidates. You could kind of see uh, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, uh, a lack of, a, of empathy, full you know, empathy for where how women could suffer if this was taken away. I, I say, but it's sort of true. Just even in that first terrible debate with with Joe Biden. He couldn't even bring himself really to use the word abortion, right? I mean, and that's not so, I mean, that's not so unique among American men. They don't understand women's health. A lot of them don't understand much about women's bodies, believe it or not. Seems like we'd be better at that than we are. So yeah, there was a big difference. And you're right. Women knew and now know that something's been taken away from them that their very lives really rely upon and depend upon. And it's and it shows in their and their political action since then. Yeah, the whole uh, attack against uh, your women's have, uh, control over their bodies has resulted in uh, maternity deserts, particularly in Texas, where someone needing uh, a, a pregnant woman needing care, needing a pediatrician or a, a, a place to deliver their child, they can't necessarily go there unless they're in a metropolitan area. Out of the rural areas, there are very few, uh, and they're getting less and less hospitals. Hospitals are going out of business, and uh, maternity care is not an option. It's a lot of the hospitals that are still in business. And, uh, you know, we, I remember the attacks against abortion clinics, bombers, you know, throwing bombs at abortion clinics and people assassinating abortion doctors. And that got a lot of negative reaction to that whole thing. So I guess they got smart, if there is such a thing, and decided to go with something that people wouldn't attack. And that's the judiciary, you know, it, it seems like un-American to go against the Supreme Court, even though the people there are r rather un-American. But it just, uh, uh, it, it amazes me that people think that uh, getting rid of something like Planned Parenthood would be a good thing. And it's, it's proved to be a disaster with them being cut off in many areas. You know, some years ago, I had this, you know, I don't think it's on YouTube anymore. Uh, it was Wayne Christian. He was in the House. He went on to serve on the, at a state agency and elected to the Railroad Commission. Some of your, that doesn't have as much to do with railroads as it does regulation of oil and gas for your listeners. Uh, but I had a tape of him. Um, I will say it was back in the uh, uh, mid to late two. Uh, 2000s, in which he just confessed on tape that they were not going to stop at abortion. They were after contraceptives. They were after in vitro fertilization. I mean, what he was basically saying is this is about the return of a patriarchal hierarchy. He couldn't use terms like that. There's too many syllables in those two words for him. To, but you know what he was getting at was that. And, and it's not a coincidence that this sort of significant return of a kind of a male dominated authoritarian um, philosophy of government that we have lost that right to abortion as that has grown stronger and stronger and stronger. It's of a piece. I mean, it is the intention is to return women to second class citizenship with not, not only not power over their own bodies, but very little political power relative to the power of the male hierarchy. Yeah, that goes hand in hand with the great replacement theory, and uh, that which boggles my mind. We're being replaced. You know, that's the whole new 
uh, Trump claim Biden and Harris are bringing these people in to replace the white folk? I can't. I don't know how. And see, of course, it's nothing new, really, is it? It's just sort of like, I, mean, I, I shouldn't generalize too terribly much about this, but how did so many European white men get so insecure? I mean, honestly, you know, I mean, uh, it, all of this comes from some deep insecurity that they're, that, that somebody's going to take something they have away from them. Or they can't compete with people in certain ways. I don't, I don't really don't know what it is. It's, but it drives this need to dominate so they don't have to fret about losing to somebody else every day of their lives. You know, it's a sad thing to see. Um, they, they pretend that they do this out of strength. But really, it's 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 out of a, a very unflattering weakness, I think, in the men who really really begin to believe and to act in those ways. Well, in a way, they may actually be victims themselves. That that there are people who have an interest in gaining significant power, and they do that by pulling various levers. And one of those levers may be to activate insecure white men, you know, and, and convince them that, that the trends in culture are, are working against them and that there's too many people of color and that women are starting to have too much power and that we, we ought to do something about that. Right. But, you know, part of the end result is that you, you throw power to some dictator, you know, and I like Trump famously seems to want to be a dictator, though. I don't I think somebody's pulling his strings, too. You know, you just got to wonder about all of that. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I do I do think they though those who in, in search of power pull those levers with great in, in, intent and it works. Now, you said something else there that's also astonishing as a lack of a sense of history among so many. It's like people seem to think that if they get a dictator, it's only going to be a dictator over those people they don't like. They're going to stay free, of course, but this dictator is only going to mess with people they already don't like. And it never in history has worked out that way, ever. The people who think they're getting the kind of dictator leader they want always wind up being just as victimized as anyone else under such leadership. And you'd think people could like, you know, learn it in high school, learn it in junior high or middle school and not fall for it over and over, but they sure do. It's, um, well, I look at the people who are showing up at the Trump rallies and <clears throat> I can't really imagine that Trump really gives a shit about them. You know, I think that, uh, that they're deluded into thinking he has their back, but he no, doesn't. No, no, they are. I mean, that's a whole other um Trying to, trying to understand, first of all, to understand those people that are, no matter what, overlooking everything they know is bad about Trump, the things he said, the things he's done. And it's become, he has succeeded in becoming sort of wrapped up into their own identities of those people. They can't let go of Trump because it would require them to let go of part of themselves at this point. It's also... To me, it's it's more of a social thing than an actual political thing. A lot of those MAGA people, a lot of them voting now, weren't voting before, weren't politically, weren't particularly political. But now they're in this social movement where every, those around them are all in the movement. They can't reject the movement without exiling themselves from their sphere of life. That's pretty powerful, you know, restraint on independence. And you see it in cults and cult-like organizations around the world. They're kind of stuck there and they have no way of getting out. And it's hard to, like we were talking about at the outset, there are no facts that will persuade them otherwise, right? It's it's like persuading somebody out of a religion. It doesn't work um, because they didn't reason to that belief in the first place. So why would we think they could reason out of it? Time cures it, you know, uh, but you know, all those millennial cults over the ages where the end days don't happen when the prophet said they were going to happen. It didn't seem to bother the prophet's followers one bit. It just said, well, they got the date wrong. It's going to happen day after tomorrow, not tomorrow. It's the same phenomenon. 
Yeah, Trump has a, a new follower. Uh, well, it's an old follower who's his new buddy on his uh, tours of the nation at his rallies. Laura Loomer, what in the world just is having that as your your confidant? I'll, although I have some ideas on that, but uh, yeah, I might get sued by saying it. But uh, I think you know what I'm saying. There's he has a history with women and oh and Melania's coming out with a book, a memoir, and it's getting no publicity at all. The Guardian was writing about that today and it's like, okay, what's going on with that? So Trump's history with women is pretty spotty. Here's a place where the Laura Loomers of the world, if we've watched we we this sort of helped just sort of seeded the the opinion sphere, the media sphere for Trump's success in that uh, over the years, outrage sold. But to to sell outrage tomorrow, you had to be more outrageous than you were yesterday. It didn't really matter. Facts didn't matter. It was all entertainment, really. I mean, it was and it was had ratings on TV and print mentions in the press. But to get them, you had to be outrageous. And this is a phenomenon on the right more than the left. And so they've got to this point where these loomers are out there now. Well, there's things that, I mean, or, or Vance more or less admitting that he made up stories about Haitians eating cats and dogs in Springfield, Ohio. I mean, they, that is selling outrage to get attention. He more or less admitted it when he said he made it up, right? And uh, he created the story. So that was happening before, I mean, it, that's that's been a culture, a media culture of phenomenon in America for, you know, it's developed over many decades, I think, really. But it it fits the needs of a wannabe dictator like Donald Trump, right? Who who can exploit the habits we've gotten into in our culture and in media lives that that require more outrage day after day after day after day until the outrage is so ridiculous. You know they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have said these things in in vaudeville years ago, much less as truth in twenty twenty four. Um, but we've let it happen. We created it, and we sort of created this world that a guy like Trump could exploit. And now we got to uncreate it. Yeah, these people should uh, look at uh, what happened to our old buddy Alex Jones. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen much of him lately, uh, and uh, there's a good reason for that. He finally had to pay for his sins. No, no, absolutely. That's another part of that um, the phenomenon I'm trying to speak of here. I'm not very articulately, I'm afraid, but what's happened is that we have almost like physically or our embodied lives are now disconnected from the consequences of this great video game we're all in day after day after day, right? So to so many people out there, they've they've lost sight of the fact that the consequences of things they may say and do, like attacking a whole population of people in Springfield, Ohio, uh, and accusing them in that old saw, uh, of these kinds of people eat dogs, or these kinds of people eat rats, or these kinds of people eat your cats, uh, but they they do it without thinking a second thought about the consequences of what they're saying because it's part of a game disconnected from the actual earth where real people and real animals live and things happen to those people. They just let that doesn't enter their they have no soul for it whatsoever because it's all to win the video game they're in. Um, and I think a lot of the audience is in that same place where, well, those outrageous things are said by Trump about uh, uh, women candidates, or about anybody really. So, and it's like it's like a rest, TV wrestling match to him. It's like it doesn't have to be real; doesn't have to have a consequence. It's fun that Trump does it. Yeah, he's beating up somebody I don't like. The consequences of those actions are lost on people because we don't really live in the world, the earthy world of consequences anymore. You know, and that's something else we've got to restore. We got a lot to do. So that's that's a thing that was kind of common with the internet all along. Uh, you know, flame wars and so forth. The fact that that you were at kind of a level of abstraction. You know, you were online as a kind of text object conversing with other text objects, 
and uh, anger and outrage and, you know, powerful negative feelings that you normally uh, deprioritized or channeled elsewhere, whatever, you, you would never introduce them into your day-to-day -day conversation with people. It felt like safe to just let that stuff loose, you know, when you're just kind of in some text-based environment with somebody often, early on at least, you didn't even know what they looked like. You weren't even sure they were a human being. So uh, it's like we're at a kind of, uh, we're all, as uh, I, I think you said it well, a game. We're all in kind of a video game. And the real problem is you talk about the consequences is that you're not taking it seriously and you don't believe that there are serious consequences. You come to believe that it's all just like fiddling around. And the problem is that the fiddling around that you're doing that might, I mean, it might be okay to like pick people off in, in a video game like Call of Duty or something like that. But if you go out in the street and start picking people off, you know, people die, it has consequences. I think we've lost the sense of that. I'm afraid so. I think I just repeated what you said. You said it well, John. Let me say, I like to use that metaphor of disconnection from the earth. Uh, we're, we're like floating in the air. The problem is going to be because of that, one political consequence is the earth isn't going to like that. <laughs> and the earth's going, going to pull us back to, back down to earth in ways that we may not ultimately find so beneficial for us as a species, because we're so disembodied and so disconnected uh, from consequences, as you say, that that big consequence, which involves the climate crisis, uh, we don't even feel when we feel it, right? We don't feel it when, when, the, when the fire is racing toward our home in California or the seas are covering our rooftops in Florida and Louisiana. Uh, we can't feel it because we've let ourselves get so grow so distant from the real earthy world in which we live. It's like uh, uh, air conditioning, really. Uh, we all have air conditioning in our houses here in Austin, so we we can stay safely in our homes and ignore the fact that it's triple digits outside. Uh, it's because we're not experiencing nature. We're sheltered from nature. We're in, inside of a bubble. And I can one of the things I think about Trump, you know, he looks like he's kind of getting a little bit wild and crazy. And I think part of that is that he's been inside of a social media bubble. He gets constant adulation from the people who love him. And then there's these others out there who seem to hate him or fear him or whatever. Uh, and we would think with good cause. And um, I don't, I think that as you're in a situation like that and you get more and more adulation and you can say outrageous things and people will just kind of accept it and nod and be okay with it, you kind of get more and more extreme. And you can see that with him. He's getting more and more extreme. And I always thought this about Trump that he was eventually going to kind of go overboard with his shtick and and start alienating even the people who thought well of him early on. And I just wonder if that's not starting to happen right now. Uh, yeah, I think it is. I said exactly the same thing. You know, remember that old 1950s movie, you know, Face in the Crowd? I think it was like 57 to 58. Andy Griffin. Lonesome Roads. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, and that kind of reminds me where the, the sort of the more and more extreme. It, it's also part of what I said earlier, though, that to to sell outrage, you got to sell a new outrage every day, you know. So part of it is kind of a natural evolution. Um, uh, but he is the shtick may be finally wearing on people to where the point it's just not. It, it that happens too. In fact, it's. It always happens. The length of time is different in different cases, but stars fall. And one other note on that isolation that you speak of, I think it happens to, to, to celebrities of all kinds. I mean, ultimately, they, all celebrities 
live in, in a celebrity bubble that's created around them. <clears throat> and it hurt. I mean, I know several close friends that are kind of celebrities and, and it hurts them and they know and they speak about it. You know, when, when you, you see it in interviews from time to time, or you'll see it with celebrities all of a sudden move to a distant ranch somewhere and don't see people for a while. Shelly Duvall was a good example. Moved to Texas out in the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. They can't help but get isolated. When they're isolated, they see and feel less and less, or they only see and feel what's shown to them by that bubble they're encased in. And and many try to escape it, and some try like Trump. You know, don't try to escape it. They try to thrive in it. Well, you know, I've been on. Yeah. I've been working and living online since the mid eighties and I always had to avoid being too uh, hung up in it because I would find myself being isolated. I would be in a little silo of uh, online. And I'm seeing that happen with a lot of kids, unfortunately, with a lot of the new uh, online services, they're online all the time. And you're seeing you know, these, uh, challenges going out uh, on spectrum on like TikTok and uh other services where they say you know you should go out and do that they've you know created a swatting uh you know uh, i don't know what what it's called a swatting challenge i guess and people all over the world now are sending out these threats by phone by email to police departments and they're swatting just you know, all sorts of people. And uh, in the news today, I, I'm seeing, you know, swatting uh, of, you know, malls, high schools. It's just crazy. And, uh, you know, I love being online, but sometimes you have to watch out that you get so tied up into a particular kind of online activity that it can become toxic. So, and it's and addictive. That's funny that you'd mentioned that there's a, I was just watching this British, I guess, sort of detective show. It's like a detective show, but it's like the family service people helping out to solve and help families, victims of crime. But anyway, one of those young men, teenage, teenager in that show, set in Northern England, he was a victim of one of those challenges where they had him commit petty crimes and then they videotaped it, like shoplifting this and shoplifting that. And they got a once they'd amassed enough videotapes, they blackmailed him and said, Now you're going to give us $500 or we're going to make all of your crimes public. Apparently, that's not as uncommon uh, as we might have hoped. Uh, it's too bad that they're that uh, they can be so easily captured at such a young age into those kinds of worlds, isn't it? I mean, it really is. I, I for one, didn't. I didn't know it could happen. I was such a I was such a kind of utopian about the coming of the digital world that uh, I only I thought it would all be roses forever. I didn't see the downside. We all were, yeah. I, I was the same way. I was, you know, I mean, uh, if I'm known for anything, it's for being an advocate for the internet for so many years and an early adopter and so forth. We couldn't see this coming, you know it. I mean, I can remember when people were horrified that Catter and Siegel started advertising via email and it was, oh my God, uh, spam, you know, spam suddenly appeared and we couldn't imagine it. But of course that was going to happen. I mean, it was an obvious thing and all these other things should have been obvious to us, but we, we, I guess we led sheltered lives. I guess so. I don't, I, uh, I, have, uh, even though my livelihood sort of would require me to do it, I have really left my face, my Facebook got badly hacked. Somebody stole my login and Facebook could not help me restore it. So I just said, well, would, would not, right? Would not. They probably know. could have. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I, because of Elon Musk, I just, quit x i just thought well i you know whatever tiny you know dot zero 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 point one penny that he could make off of me i wasn't going to let him so i've sort of like you know as a guy that's lived in you know to deep my all my career has been attached to the public sphere one way or the other so 
I need, you know, for as a journalist for half of it, and I was a, an author, activist, consultant for the other half, all of them required me to stay in touch with what's going on in the culture and politics. But I have found that I'm not missing much without that, you know, without social media, it hadn't inhibited uh, you know, my understanding of what's going on out there. Although it's natural that I would miss things that are unique to it, especially in younger generations. So some of the opinion leaders and influencers uh, in generations younger than, uh, than mine, it's hard to keep up with them because I don't have exposure to them. I do miss that, right? But other than that, I don't miss a lot. I was misleading myself that I was getting a lot from it, I think. Yeah, early on, I w would go online and I would come away feeling like I'd learned something. I'd been inspired because there were a lot of people out there that were just inspiring and uh, smart people who were posting things that I wanted to read and hear. And over time, you know, the uh, people that were not so inspiring discovered that uh, you know, they could go online and say and do anything. And the, you, you, we ended up with the you know, QAnon and MAGA people just flooding all of these online services. And uh, once again, uh, they had to pay the price because I've seen a lot of people that were involved in January 6th being taken away and arrested because of what they posted online. People don't realize that just because you deleted it doesn't make it go away. The, and the cops have learned that quite well. No, that's true. I should say, because uh, I could recommend his work to everybody, he's on Substack now too, Ted Joya, G-I-O-I-A. He's a longtime his music historian. Yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, he lives in Austin now, you know. And, uh, oh, I didn't know that. He lives in Austin, and he's doing a whole lot of work on, let's say, the degradation of the uh, digital algorithmic world. He, he, he laments it because he knows what it's meant to the in the early days to the music industry, which he so loves. And now he knows how it's inhibiting them. I would recommend you track him down maybe for a future podcast. He's very articulate guy, as you know. Um, and he, yeah, he absolutely. Does, he does his research on these things. It's, I don't have any idea how he has so much time to do what he does, but he, he's a productive guy. Yeah, I'm the same here. I, I, he's one of the, I guess there's like two sub stacks that I actually pay for, and his is one of them. The other one is uh, um, uh, Heather. Um, Cox Richardson. Why am I drawing a blank? Cox Richardson, Heather Cox Richardson, yeah. That's funny. It was kind of amazing, too. I mean, how could you live without her? That's two of the few I'll take. What were you say? Yeah, there, you know, there are some great sub stacks out there. You know, our, our friend Chris Brown that we just uh, interviewed uh, does a great thing on you know his explorations of the urban wildlife. There's just great subject matter out there that you don't see on Facebook. I don't know that one. His name's Chris Brown, Urban Wildlife. Mm -hmm. like it's I'm called Field Notes. The the next sub stack is actually called Field Notes. Got to check that out. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. Um, you know, I I believe though in, in talking about particularly like social media, which is so much uh, of how people experience the internet. Um, we're seeing a lot of terrible things happen and, you know, humans can be pretty bad monkeys sometimes, but, um, um, I think, I tend to think that we're in a, a transition because this was a huge change. It's, it's, and Jeff Jarvis has written about this some about, um, he wrote about, um, the advent of print and what a, a massive change that was and how it took hundreds of years for humans to sort of learn how to uh, evolve with that change and cope with it and manage it. And I think it's the same thing with, with the internet. The internet's only been around as a, a sort of mainstream internet for about 30 years now. And that may seem like a lot, but it's really not a lot for, for a complete revolution in communications. 
And we're seeing these things evolve. For instance, like Twitter, for, long, for the longest time, Twitter had evolved to the point that, that journalists and politicians and so forth felt that this was a place where they had to be, you know, and, and all the other journalists, all the other politicians were there. And then Elon Musk bought it and started, you know, trashing the place, basically, and changed it to X. And a lot of people left. And they didn't all go to one place. So now you've got people on Mastodon and people on Blue Sky and people on Threads and on various forms of social media. And that is part of the evolution. And, and uh, you no longer have so much of that stuff happening in one place. And I don't pretend to know exactly where this is going to go, but I do have some confidence that rational human beings will learn at some, over time to to better use the gift of the you know persistent connectivity to each other that we have the many to many internet uh, because I still think it's a net positive and I, I see so much good coming from the internet. Uh, I mean, we see some terrible things happening now, and right now, what's happening is that that some people are using the internet to sort of try to hack culture and and uh you know like this whole maga thing like creating trump has created this cult and he's trying to to take significant power in the u.s i don't think that's really going to work i think we're going to swing back to a more rational space and i also think that uh that the internet and social media are going to um, become less toxic. Well, it to is the too, extent that they are toxic. We pause a moment and say, do we have to, yeah. because the tragedy is happening in real time today and yesterday? I hate to just use it as a metaphor, but I'm going to anyway. Is the Israeli technology technology that just allowed them to blow up? the digital devices of other people, thousands of people in Lebanon, seems to me like a, a metaphor of the dangers of the digital world, right? It's like, kind of like, oh my Lord, now it's, um, how they did that, I still haven't read. I don't know how they did it, but they did do it, you know? That sounds um, like something out of a sci-fi novel I once read, and it's like, that is absolutely frightening because no one seems to know how they did it. There are a lot of theories, but uh, who knows? Yeah, you know, and I just think that is now in terms of uh, I agree that things will that how to say this. I still remain such an optimist and and, and even a, a kind of a utopian in my thinking really. Though we never get there, I think things generally evolve. Like Alfred North Whitehead said, basically things evolve towards beauty and the good. All things in the universe, because it's so rewarded with ongoing life, so to speak. So, yeah, I think we go through a transition and things get a little bit better and a little bit worse and then a little bit better than they ever were. And I think the same will be true of our technologies. I'm a little... I'm a little bit worried that there are there are doomsday points we have to get by along the way, right? I mean, that's we can see that once again with the climate. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna pass these tipping points, or I call them doomsday points, where maybe it'll be really really hard to keep progressing in a productive way or evolving into a productive way. But if we can make it past those points. I think things do get better. And I think the digital technology and the internet will, will be one of those if we can keep it together as we struggle through sometimes like Elon Musk and, and the debacle of X. Yeah, I think climate's the hard one. I think it's it's gonna be really difficult for us to um, to mitigate the problem with climate change. Uh, we may find ourselves having to adapt to some extent and it's a frightening problem, you know, and it could it could well be an extinction event. But I think we'll start dealing with it. I mean, it's sort of like when your roof leaks, you patch your roof eventually. You may kind of let it go for a while. You may even try to convince yourself that it's not really leaking. That water's coming from somewhere else. But eventually you're going to do what has to be done. And uh, certainly there's humans that are 
are irrational, but I think for the most part, we're rational enough to act in our own interest ultimately, even though we see a lot of evidence otherwise right now. We're going to have to if we're going to survive it. There's no, as a species, I mean, that's going to happen. There's not a, there's not much of a gray area there or in between world, you know. So sooner or later, we will deal with it. It's like to use the, the expression, we fix our, our leaking roofs, but we don't always agree to fix the other guy's leaking roof, right? We don't realize it could happen to us next. You know, it's happening to them. It's like, yeah, we can shrug it off. But we got to realize that we're all under one roof here. And it's leaking. Um, so we have to address it. Yeah, the problem Absolutely. with uh, addressing part of climate change is uh, doing away with the influence of the fossil fuel uh, manufacturers, the oil companies, the gas companies, in politics. Because here in Texas, uh, you don't get anything done if it's going to endanger the uh, oil business. You, you can watch every time someone says, well, we need to uh, do more renewables, you know, more uh, wind tur uh, turbines, you know, more uh, solar farms. But immediately the politicians go, well, no, we can't do that because uh, what they don't say is we can't do that because we won't get any uh, campaign donations from the, <laughs> the big oil companies. And that's kind of the tail that wags the dog uh, in, in, in politics in Texas. I have no idea how to get past that. I mean, I, they're, they're, the, it makes me sad when I think about it, because I just don't know how you, how you diminish, I mean, we'd have to diminish the power of money would work. We could target just the oil industry, but really take money out of it. You had the U.S. Supreme Court basically say money is more powerful than your speech. So the hell with you. If they got more money, they're going to get their way. And that is the Citizens United decision. So that's even going to be hard to get rid of the money uh, as as we operate under that ruling now from the Supreme Court some years ago. Um, one of the the I mean, I know that it was true that the the oil and gas industry, the global oil and gas industry knew what was coming a long time ago. Now, they're betting, they're, they make all kinds of excuses. They, you know, they're, they're betting on their stranded costs. So they have all this investment that's already in fields they've already developed. They can't just abandon it. Um, I think they scare themselves about that. But ultimately, without addressing this, I mean, we, we can, we can kind of glibly speak about the diminishment of human life altogether. But in one way of, if, if we can look at it like the oil industry would look at it, that is the diminishment ultimately of their consumers. So they're speaking of doomsday point, the oil and gas industry have one coming too, which is they're going to run out of people to buy their gasoline, right? They're going to run out of people to buy cars that need gasoline They're going or fuel oil. Uh, uh, they got to see that. I know they see it coming. I mean, we know people that work... Shell was an early leader in sort of the futurist world that was done by oil and gas industry. They were very responsible about it. In some cases, a lot of it was um, Betty Sue Flowers from the University of Texas years ago, one of my favorite professors, by the way. She had worked with them on that futurist work. It was well done. It was interesting. So we know they know it, but maybe they're just like so many of the rest of us. They're just disconnected from the consequences of what they do. That's a fundamental problem. It's like... The, the consequences, the true costs of their decisions today are lost on them. And they don't see any further than what the, today's decision gets them by the close of business, right? And it could be that that's the simplest explanation is a sort of myop, you know, myopic or blindness. Uh, you know, it's like um, it's they know not what they do. Yeah, the Republicans are attacking Harris for... Uh her comments about fracking and uh, anytime you bring up anything against fracking, it's just like you would, uh, you know, said God doesn't exist or something. <laughs> and they uh, forget that uh, there's a, been a big impact right out in the area of Texas where John and I grew up in West Texas. They've been having 4.0 earthquakes. I never had an earthquake when I was growing up out there. 
it's all the fracking, all the wastewater they're throwing, pushing back into the you know, the uh, earth, and it's it's had an impact. And same things happening in New Mexico and the oil air, areas of New Mexico. They're having the same problems: increasing earthquake instability in the geology. Yeah, I don't think I think efforts. I don't know. I, this is a topic that's probably much bigger than we have time to get into right now. But I'm I'm not sure any of us really constructed the arguments in and around the transition out of fossil fuels the way we should have and the way the other side responded to it. To me, uh, a, a quick way of describing this maybe just my own feeling is sort of like. For the very first Earth Day, which I helped celebrate, by the way, uh, I took pride in that. All right, I'm standing up. I'm standing for this. I'm standing up to that. It became sort of an identity with me, right? And then that identity begins to get more of my, my attention than the real problem. So I'm sort of doing things that feed my ego more than I'm doing things that solve the damn problem in the first place. And I think the movement, the environmental movement, suffers somewhat from that. And I think... The fossil fuel industry and its supporters also suffer from the same thing. So we're at these loggerheads with one another where we can't get to real solutions because our own individual characters and identities are so wrapped up in one way. It's got to be this. It's got to be that. And, and well, there's no room for compromise. It's you've got to end fracking or not end fracking. There's no half fracking, so to speak. Well, I, I say that flippantly, but you get my point. Yeah, that applies in other in other areas too, for sure. Uh, just the idea of getting so wrapped up in a particular way of thinking that you can't bust yourself loose. And you know, I we, I can remember a time when people who were on the right and people who were on the left would have civil conversations respecting each other's different viewpoints. Uh, didn't always happen that way, but but it happened some that way, and it's not happening much that way right now. No, I so agree with you about that. It it didn't always work that way, but more often than not, it did. We could we we when I worked for the Democratic Lieutenant Governor here, Bill Hobby, years ago, and, and the Republican was governor, and we didn't agree about much at all. And but staff to staff, we could have dinner and work things out. You know, and it wasn't personal. We didn't always get the best solution. Sometimes we had to give more than we wanted to, et cetera. But we didn't. Getting to the solution was where we our identity went. Now that doesn't seem to be such the case. It is, it is standing up for what I already believe rather than sort of in the tradition of the great American pragmatists, like testing things out and continuing to change and evolve until we get what's really needed. You know, with an open mind and an open heart and a willingness to listen, uh, those are not values in, um, uh, in good standing in our opinions and political sphere anymore. I wonder how we can sell people on the idea that we should really be that way. Well, if they look at their own lives, you know, usually in their own lives, I actually speak about this on some occasions, they recognized times when they were that way that produced, you know, real good for them, right? They can, they'll can recognize a time when they got a new insight and had to change their mind or alter their behavior in a relationship or see their children in a different light or see their parents in a different light. And so alter that, what they were, how they were acting in the relationship or in a job or in a profession where they switch. They have examples in their own lives about where their own open minds and hearts led them to a better place than they had been. So we need to get them thinking about that and taking it into the collective world. If that was true, when you decided that this path wasn't exactly what it should be for you and you altered to this path, now you've got to have the same openness to our collective work together. And maybe it'll turn out the same way your own change worked out for you. So we have reached the end of the hour, Glenn. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation and I'm thinking a bunch of other things we could talk about. Maybe you can come back sometime and we'll talk some more. I love talking to y'all. Please, whenever you find room for me, let me come on because I oh, like doing it. You're always welcome around. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we'll do it again soon. 
Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, man. Take care, y'all. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.